Good morning. Hey, so um, we're pleased to be with you today and into the future. We're from the Department of Human Services in the Child and Family Services Division. A team of us are putting these series together, short workshops for parents to provide some tips, strategy, skills, and to create connections with parents. This is a tough time for all of us, and together we can get through this. I want to make sure you know that I'm Michael Swisher. I am with Child Family Services Division. I am also a parent of two, and we're all living and working and doing everything in the same place. On the other side, we also have Kim. I'll let you introduce yourself, Kim. Hi, I'm Kim Durand. I'm also with the Arlington Partnership for Children, Youth, and Families. I don't have kids. I chickened out of that, but I have lots of nieces and nephews, and uh, I'm thrilled to be here with Michael and um I'll be helping to moderate. Uh, we have a chat box, and that's how we'll be uh, communicating between each other today. Awesome. So our hope really is that this is useful. Uh, what we've set this up so it's twenty minutes of content. After that, we'll have we'll be open ten minutes for any Q and A. So please go ahead and load your questions into the chat box. We welcome any sort of discussion, ideas, and sharing in the chat box. We are also able to remain on this in this space if people are interested in staying longer for further discussion. Um, but we're, so let us know a little bit about yourself. We invite you to do that right now. Um, as it says on the screen, if you pop in your zip code, number of kids and schools they attend, if you've got any who are not quite in school yet, pre-K, let us know that too. This is not any sort of identifier. This is merely so we know who we're reaching. Are we hitting the audience we want to hit? Okay. So thanks for sharing that. We will not use any of that information. We won't be sharing any of that. It's just so we have a count of who we're serving. So as you know, this is all about, this is part of a series. We've got a larger series that's going on, um, helping parents and providing all sorts of what I consider sort of behavior management things. We're getting us through the day to day. This in particular, we've had a thing around support. Last week, we did thing on routines, or excuse me, structure. We did thing on routines last week. You can check that out on the web page, as you see, www.apcyf.org. Um, you'll find that webinar, and we'll be posting this as well, and any future ones we're doing. Today, though, we're doing sort of a two for one. We're cramming two of these in, structuring space and stuff, actually, and then limits and expectations. Sort of two pieces coming together, not necessarily related, but all under the big umbrella of structure. Next week, we'll continue this series on managing behaviors. Uh, it will look at incentives, how to get kids to do things they don't want to do. And then on the 23rd, in two weeks, we'll be doing one on consequences, what we do when they do things we don't want them to do. So if you have other ideas for topics, please include those, throw those in the chat so we can see that and use those, and we will do stuff that matters to you. So thank you. Let's begin today's session about organizing our spaces and our stuff. So I really divide, like to divide things into pieces. So space is really when I think about the right place for the right activity. Stuff is really around having everything, a place for everything and everything in its place. So let's look at the space first. So when I think about the space, think about what are the things we're doing with our space? What are main activities that you and your kids and all of us are doing together? Right now, it's pretty much everything. So let's get specific though. So there's work and school. I'm working from home, uh, so I know a lot of people are. Play is something we all do. Kids, I really consider play is really important for, that's their work in a sense. Um, but there's individuals, so there's a lot of toys. Sometimes it goes with that. There's play as a family. There's play that's also on screens. Meals, we're doing all that, all that together. Um, and then there's housekeeping, which includes things like prepping meals, laundry, that takes up space, cleaning house, that's keeping it all straight. Uh, for many families, worship, prayer, meditation is an important piece that also takes up space. And then exercise, I've got neighbors, little neighbors upstairs, their exercise is right on my head, but exercise is an important piece. A lot of people are trying to stay indoors, so keeping us moving. Family or social time. Social time is really important for all of us, maintaining those connections, and then finally rest and sleep. So these are all the activities that are taking place. And that is great when we've got a large space, that's a lot of things happening, okay? They all need their, their 
their space or their place. And some homes have a space for everything, which is wonderful if you do have that. Um, many do not. Regardless of the where and how what your home looks like, I really highly recommend having designated spots and places for particular activities to the extent that you can. Why is that? Really? Well, I'll tell you, we were in a home once, this is years ago, my wife and I, where the kids basically owned the house. There were toys in every room. There was play space in every room. There was no single place that wasn't for the kids. Great for the kids. I couldn't have lived there. Um, but I would also argue it wasn't necessarily good for the kids because one of the things you learn when you designate, like this place is for play, this place is for work, this is for eating, that sort of thing. They begin to learn and recognize that there are limits to what they can do. Setting those limits starts with simple things like creating a space. Here's where you do Legos and dolls and balls. Here's where you eat. Here's where you sleep. So having that sort of separation, that is even more important nowadays, especially when we're all doing all these things together. So they're learning those sort of limits and that sort of thing. So helping to build that sort of structure around spaces. Um, they internalize and understand that, okay, this is what's okay to do and this is not. These are simple little lessons that they're not even real lessons. They're just learning it as they go. So this, of course, is especially important when we're living like this, when the dining room table is everything and everybody's home all the time. So it takes a little creativity to designate spaces in a different way. Okay. And what I'm going to be offering is some stuff that you can find on Pinterest. You can Google and I'm throwing out ideas really just to get you thinking, get your creative juices flowing, to think about, okay, how can I do some of that? So I'll share some of that, okay? And since it's spring break, let's start with play. <clears throat> In our home growing up with the kids, they're older now, 14 and 19, but art was very important. And we had an art space. We had a table in the dining room, which is not a very big dining room, by the way. Was it annoying and in the way that I bang my shins on it? Yes. But was it important to us? Yes. And so we were with budding artists who are now full blown real artists, like functioning in the world. So if this is important to you, you create that space if that's what you want. But it doesn't have to be a particular space. It can be a portable space, something that is flexible. You know, if you've got a bin, if you've got a tray, even just a bucket, something that we pull it out and now it's art space. It can be art time too. again, go back to that routines thing. What are the times in your day? This is another way to help to structure that. So another thing, and my kids actually insisted when they knew what I was doing, they said, you got to have a hideaway. Kids need that. And I'll say it can be as simple as you see with the chair and a blanket, something, even if you're all together in one room, you can create a space in a small corner, something that that child can say, this is mine, at least for right now. Okay, it gives them a chance to sort of get away, collect their thoughts, refresh themselves so they can be with the rest of them. If that sounds really nice for you, maybe you can have a hideout too. I strongly advise it to having a place, especially now creating that space where we can have our own downtime. We need that sometimes to get away, especially when we're living on top of everyone every single day, 24 hours a day. So moving on to work the right place for homework and work at home. You know, it would be ideal if we all had that sort of space where kids next week, by the way, kids are going to be back on the 14th Tuesday. APS is going back to the distance learning. So kids are going to be doing their school from home. And wouldn't it be great if we all had monogrammed spaces for us to study? It would be. We don't all have that. Certainly not in my home. This is actually a photo taken from an article that talked about working from home. Really nice piece that I took away from this was really designating a space that is the workspace. So even if it, and if it is a temporary thing, like for these six hours, I am at work and this is my space. Same for the kids. They need to have that structure and we're building that in by creating that space. As you can see in the picture, the kids are doing their own little work in their own place. What is helpful for the kids? A, having a designated space. And again, even if it's only for three hours a day, whatever that is, but they have a space quiet, organized, free from distraction. Okay, the monograms is a bonus. So of course, the reality may look different in your home. So what are ways we can do that? Again, the portability, again, Pinterest and Googling ideas for a way to do this. This is just a way, how can I put all my stuff together? So when it's homework time, 
it's homework stuff. So pull all that out. This is, you know, dollar store stuff. My favorite idea, which I absolutely love because this has everything Ryan needs. It also gives him that privacy so he doesn't see what's going on. He may be able to hear it, but he can be focused entirely on homework. Other thing about this with the distractions, when our kids are in the same kitchen where we're prepping dinner or something and having conversation, maybe have the radio on, cut down on the distractions. Okay. So let's not talk to them. Give them their time. Give them their space. This is their office space. So it's all about stuff. Okay. We're spaces. It's stuff. It kind of all goes together. Um, and yes, being able to put stuff away. Having a place like this, again, going back to structure. Structure for children is safety. It's predictability. It's order. Our kids thrive on it. So having things organized, having our time organized and our spaces organized. So what do we do with all this stuff? How do we keep track of it? Again, more Pinterest ideas, but I really like this. Here's a great way to put your cars somewhere. But having a place, a space, there's a Lego space. And you see that the Lego board and then a bin for any Legos. But whatever it is your kids are doing, my mom had this great idea when, when I had nieces and nephews that were little, that there was a drawer for them with all the Tupperware and sort of things. That was their place where they could be in the kitchen while she was in the kitchen and they could be doing stuff, taking out, putting it in. But anyhow, providing, <clears throat> excuse me, these opportunities for this play. But the other thing is actually organizing the stuff. And here's where this looks phenomenal and it's a dream. It's important because what you've done when you've created a space where kids know exactly where Mickey goes and they know exactly where the stickers and the pens and the markers go is they can put it away and you don't have to you are now creating children who are autonomous independent and responsible they can do their own things you could say okay clean up and they know where stuff goes the younger ones of course are going to need a little bit of help learning that but once they get it they get it and you don't have to be in charge of it uh, the, uh, I think, well, one of the two things I want to take on this. One is that idea of giving it to the kids and making it possible. The other is it takes some time from us to be able to do this. Is it a pain in the butt? Yes. My son had a messy room. We helped. It took us three days to really get his room organized. It is now phenomenal, and he is able to do it. Developmentally, he's not able to organize all this stuff. We can say, go and clean your room. When it's a big mess, he can't. Helping him by setting up and designating shelves and things where these things go, then he's able to do it. And it's no longer our issue and it's no longer a source of conflict. So what's it going to take for you? A little bit of time, a little bit of work, big payoff. That's it on stuff. I want to move on. Stretch break. Go ahead and take a quick stretch. That's good. Ten minutes left. Awesome. So we're going to move on to continuing this whole thing around structure. And the other part of structure is the rules. What's okay to do? What's not okay to do? Why do we have these rules? It's really so kids know what to do. Okay. When they feel safe and secure, it provides that security, consistency, predictability. When they feel safe, secure, they're better, better able to manage disruptions like this and change. They learn resilience because they've started with a foundation of structure. A psychologist notes that a lot of kids, we as adults perceive them as pushing up against our limits and our structure. What they're doing is they're not trying to move it. They actually, in a world that is chaotic and crazy for them sometimes, they want to know this is still here. Mom and dad are holding firm. The folks that are raising me, they've got this. That's a stability. So when you feel kids pushing against that, that's good. They're checking to make sure it's there, which means we need to hold that space and that structure. Okay. So a lot of times with those daily interactions, as I said, around the space and the stuff where you can play and can't play, it's the same with these sort of things, reminding them little daily interactions where like, no, you can't do that, honey. I need you to stop there. Okay. You can do this now. And yes, if you've never been hated by a parent, then maybe you're not being a parent. We need, we need, they're going to be disappointed. They're going to be angry and frustrated when we take away something, when we ask them to do something they don't want to do. And that's okay. They're allowed to have their feelings, by the way. I'll say that again. They're allowed to have their feelings. But they do love you, even when they say they don't. So how do we start? It's really how kids know, kids know what to do, but really that we know what to do. 
if you're parenting with someone, if you're fortunate enough to have someone else that is with you in the room or in the house who's helping to raise kids, it's really important that you be on the same page, that you have some conversations. We all know subconsciously what our rules are. What we want to do is be as clear as possible for the kids so they're not walking a minefield. It's like, okay, it's okay to do this. They step out here. Don't do that. Oh, well, to, to, so let them know this is not okay. Here's the box. You can do anything you want in here. Outside, do not. So be very clear as possible. I'm big on having rules posted, something from my Parks and Rec days, but having it clear that kids know, and you can only point to the rule and say, remember what that is? What's number three? Thank you. So how do we set up these? Start with our own values. What is important to you in your home? Honesty, responsibility, caring for others. Is it the environment? Is it self-discipline, hard work? What are values in your home, in your family? Have that conversation if you're raising kids with someone. If you're not and you're on your own, have some time with yourself to think about that. What is really important? And do the rules you have in your home reflect those values? Let's jump into a couple of rules about rules. So, or expectations for expectations. Just a quick note, rules. I kind of have a funny thing about rules. I like it's a real easy word. What I don't like is when a rule is broken, it's broken and you can't fix it necessarily. Expectations, eh, you didn't quite meet the expectations. Let's do better tomorrow. So it's an aspirational thing. Little semantics, but being clear as possible with what we're saying Kids will say in actually some of our surveys that they're not always clear on what rules and what's okay for them to do and not do. So again, as I said, helping kids be very clear, this is okay and this is not. They're positive. If you see in this photo or picture, there's a whole lot of that no word. In fact, every single one. What are the last words you see in there though? That's what they see. Toys at the table? Oh, I wasn't even thinking about that. Great idea. The other, so I really am big on what is it you want me to do? State that clearly. If you find that instruction or a rule has the words no, don't, or stop in it, rewrite it so you're telling them what you want. No toys at the table? No. Toys stay in the bin. Toys stay in the play area. No destroying the house? No. We take care of our things. So those are just some examples of rewriting. Again, if it's a no, don't, or a stop, what, how can you stay it in a way that you're saying what you want them to do? There's a reason for the rules and you can explain it. By the way, because I said so is not a reason. I wanna say, be very clear that kids will ask why. And if they ask more than twice, they're not asking why anymore. They really don't wanna know. They just don't like the rule. In which case, tell them that. So I've already explained it. I've done explaining it. You don't, dis you don't agree or you don't like it. That's fine, but that's the end of this conversation. If we continue answering the why, the why, the why, they're just getting a delay. You're, yeah, they're winning. Um, so being clear with the reason and helping them know, it helps them learn. There's a reason why, because when you do that, then it helps to keep the house cleaner, whatever that reason is, because we have neighbors downstairs. So that's why we can't run around in the house, whatever that reason that they have a clear understanding and it helps them internalize it. So we don't need to be constantly reminding. So there's only a few. Um, that's an incredibly long list. 39 rules is just a few too many. Ideally, if you've got something posted, three to five. So just some quick examples. Again, clear, positive, have a reason, and are limited. Golden rules, there's an example. On our website, we actually have A, a handout that went through those rules for rules, but B, we have a some examples of rules. I'll actually get those in, the next, in another slide. But a place for you to pull it down, print it out, and play around with what do I want those to be in my home? So a couple things more about doing these and putting these together. Um, really, when you have routines and schedules, you've already started establishing expectations at home. This is what we do in the morning. This is what you're expected to do. It's already out there. You don't need to be following up with the kids. They know as you've built them and their ability to get that. But that routine and, and schedule, you've already set some limits and expectations. Here's what's supposed to happen before school, after school. Of course, when we're back in school, of course. The other thing is when we've got our stuff structured and put away, another clear set of expectations. This is where things go. And this is where, where they all belong so that kids know what to do with it and where it's supposed to go. When we're done playing with it, it goes away. 
gets put away where it belongs. So as I mentioned before, we've got some examples of some general rules. These are not, I don't say have all of these. These are just examples for you to think about and what you might want to have in your own family. So listen, respecting elders, being caring to family and friends. And you'll notice that under, underneath there are sort of examples of what that looks and sounds like. I'm big on that, helping kids understand this is what this rule looks and sounds like in a day-to-day -day, um, setting. Two other things about rules and expectations. First is that they must grow and change. They will change as our kids grow, okay? They're gonna get older. They are going to, there will be new experiences and new things that are happening around you, okay? And so they need to be able to, our rules need to be able to change as they do. New toys and technology, new friends, screen time, video games, boys, girls, all those sort of things. It's okay to stop and say, you know what? I'm not sure. Let's think about that. It's also okay to stop and say, hmm, you're right. We don't need that rule like that anymore. Let's talk about it. As they get older, I would expect, them, of course, as they get to the teen years, they will begin to push back. But go ahead and allow that. What else can we do differently? Other thing about rules to me that's really most important is consistency. How can you hold on to this consistently between whether whichever adult is the one talking about the rule, that it's the same, whichever child you're applying it to is consistent. I'm not saying the same because when you've got an age difference of three to five years, they're going to be different and they should be. The same rule should not be the same for a 15 and a 10 year old but make it clear and understand that, you know, the 10 year old has the rules that the 15 year old had at 10, et cetera. But that consistency is hugely important that they know day to day, minute to minute, it's gonna be the same. This is the box. This is what's okay to do. This is what's not okay to do. So that wraps up our session for today. That's our content. We certainly wanna open up for any sort of questions or comments if people have, but for those watching as a webinar, uh, we welcome you, glad you're here. Glad to have everyone here. These will be posted on videos. We will can, again next week. We'll have one on incentives, and then on the twenty third at this time, we'll have one on consequences. Stay tuned, and we look forward to having you back. Thank you. This is our contact information. We'd like to reach out if you have any specific questions. Again, our website www.apcyf.org. We are with the Department of Human Services in the Child Family Services Division. Thanks again. And we appreciate doing this for you. We hope you appreciate it. What questions are there? Questions or comments or uh, other anything? topics that you'd like to know about. If there's anything at all that you want to share with us, now would be the time to do it in the chat box. The attendee chat is um, along the top. Uh, you might also be able to, a few people have given us some thumbs up or uh, if you wanna help us um, by providing some evaluation, you can give us a one to five, one being you already know all of this and five being thanks so much you gave us some new information or somewhere in between. So I don't wanna sit here necessarily in silence, but I didn't have anything to fill up the space either. <clears throat> Well, I guess that is it. I'm not seeing anything. Um, we had great ideas to think through before our school resumes next week. No questions at this time. Um, I just, everybody stay safe. Wash your hands, don't touch your face. Wear and your covering when you're out. the structure. <laughs> Got a, thanks for the information. I thought the graphics were very helpful as well as the recap slides at the end. We got another thanks and we got a four, so that's good. All right. Wonderful. Thank well, you we can time. always, I'll pop it back up here too. If you've got any other questions or thoughts that people that come up as you're getting through your day, please contact us. We are available. We are working. We're here for you. 
Love the discussion of having a place for stuff. Containers are a great place for kids to organize their toys. One thought I had about that, Michael, is you had um, some things uh, labeled with words, but for the little kids, it could be by color. You know, put uh, put all of your Legos in the blue bin and put your crayons in the red bin. And, you know, maybe that helps um, uh, their getting used to the colors and things like that. So there could be other ways to organize. Absolutely. Colors and also pictures. So yes, ways you're, that's a good point because the, the two, three and four year olds aren't necessarily reading yet. But they can put their things away because they all know the, the games away, toys away. They all know the songs to put the things away. So All right. Thank you all very much. Have a wonderful afternoon and we'll see you next time. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. And I think you, how oh, can I end this?